Hello, my name is Jerry Schroeder. I'm going to be talking about the idea of confluence or conflict between Torah and Teva, between Torah and the, the way the Torah sees the world and the way the science sees the world. And in today's session that I gave it, it, it where I was teaching, uh, a student came up and said, can you please tell me just in like five minutes the idea of how 14 billion years, which science measures as the age of the universe, can also equal six 24-hour days, which Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 says, God creates the universe, first sentence of the Bible, by verse 26, five and a half days after that first sentence, we have Adam, and we're given, we're told that that takes five and a half days, and science says 14 billion years. And the answer lies in the subtlety of the text. Well, first we have to get, out of, get understanding. All of ancient commentary tells us that the six days of Genesis, Genesis chapter one is broken into six days, divided into six days by the statement, a statement there was evening and morning. And then the days are numbered. Those days are 24 hours each. They are not long periods of time, yet the universe is 14 billion years old. How do we understand that to be the case? And they're both literally true. That's what I want to get to do in the next about four to five minutes, okay? Both Maimonides, both Nachmanides in the year 1250 and Rashi in the year 1090 tell us that the days are 24 hours each. They tell us that time is created at the creation, but then there's a caveat added. But they say, however, only when matter forms from the energy of creation, these are the words. The first creation wasn't stuff, according to ancient commentary. The first, it was something so thin, it had no essence. Dakma od ein bomamash, you couldn't grab it but it turned into something that you could, to solid matter. E, that's E, that's Einstein's famous E equals MC squared. But we're talking a thousand years ago, okay? And it's in the text. Come to class and we'd spend hours on this, if you like. It's in my, my books also talk about it. So here we go. The, Torah, the Bible numbers the days, and here is the key. It is Nachmanis that points it out. The, at end of each day, the day is numbered. Evening and morning, one day. Evening and morning, a second day. Evening and morning, a third day as the days go by. Second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. But the first day isn't first. It's day one. The reason being that the Bible, we're told, not that my idea, that the Bible sees time from the beginning looking forward. For the six days of Genesis, the Torah does not look back from Sinai where Moses gets, gets the Torah. It receives from the beginning. And therefore it says day one because there wasn't a second day. We're told that if the texts were looking backward from Sinai, there'd been hundreds of thousands of days between, between, between the creation of the universe and Moses on Sinai. So they would, talks would have said a first day because by the time you get to the Sinai, there'd been hundreds of thousands of second days that had passed. So you could say a first day, like the First World War. Who, no one called the First World War the First World War during the First World War, except the pessimists. They happen to be right. The Second World War came along. Everyone calls the First World War the First World War, no longer the Great War, the Big War. So we look back in time. So the question is, as the universe expands, the NASA diagram, which you've all seen so often, NASA, type in N-A-S-A on Google, then type in W-M-A-P, the initials for this satellite, you get this diagram, every word is from NASA. We look back in time, we measure 14 billion years. The Torah sees time from a totally not human perspective. From right near the beginning, not right at the equate at the beginning where we see this inflation, but right at the very just a squidgen of time after, about a hundred thousandth of a second after, when the first matter forms, because that's what the text tells us. When matter forms, time is time grabs a hold. Nachmani, Hasman Nivra, time is created at the creation, but time grabs hold with matter, Mishi Yeshit Fos Bozman. It's about a hundred thousandth of a second, approximately. And we have the first matter, it's called protons. Now I know the energy level of the universe at which the first matter forms. So I know this number. I know the energy level now because scientists measure the energy density of space today. That ratio is how much space has stretched. This is a gigantically large number. This is a quite a small number. That ratio is how much time, how much time has stretched. And it doesn't stretch linearly. Notice, first of all, this, this exponential expansion. 
but it's it's the rate of the rate of change is is nonlinear. As I move my fingers apart, although I'm going to move them apart at a constant rate, the fractional change in space is very different. I'll say double each time space doubles. Double, 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 double. Although the universe is expanding more or less at the same rate, the rate, the fractional rate of change varies. And that fractional rate of change can be described with many equations. The equation that I use is the most common equation in the universe. It's the one that describes the, the radioactive decay of all atoms. It is essentially the equation that got that got us to be us and the matter to be matter. It's A equals A zero, e to the minus lambda t, for those that know the math. The A zero determines the answer. It is totally, 100%, a science number. It has nothing to do with Jerry Schroeder, nothing to do with these, cal with these calculations. And what we discover is that this ratio, as, as the universe expands, the perception of time becomes, becomes uh, warped, put it this way. When, let us say, this is the amount of, of distance that time, that light will travel, let's say, in a second. It's, of course, it's vastly big, okay? It's the rate of the amount of distance light travels has nothing to do with its frequency. It is totally the speed of light, which is constant. So when the energy is high, there are many, 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 many waves here because the energy of a wavelength, the energy of, a, of light is determined, upon, determined by its frequency, which makes sense. Which looks more energetic? Or, of course, it's, that's, that's uh, Planck's famous, uh, okay. A dis a discovery. So when the when the universe is small and hot, the, the number of waves would be like you couldn't save them fast enough in here. But by the when the universe is stretched out and much colder, then it's more like tick tick. And those waves are the ticking of the cosmic clock. The ratio averaged over all of them based on what comes out of this equation. It's not the instantaneous ratio, but it's averaged over them all. It's much more interesting to see the actual calculation, which I'll show you in a moment. But the, the ratio overall is 900 billion, which means that if I had nine, on the average, if I had 900 billion seconds worth of history, I don't know the dinosaurs. From the Bible's point of view, it would be one second, and those 900 billion seconds would be squeezed as a video, it's super, super, super fast forward. If I had 900 billion hours, I don't know what that would be, it would be one hour. 900 billion days of our time would be one day. And what's amazing is, with no trick whatsoever, when you condense the 14 billion years by the 900 billion, which is what spins out of this equation with no control over me, averaged over the time, the 14 billion years become, become five and a half days.